So good afternoon, um, evening, morning, depending on your um, place in the world. Um, um, on behalf of SSR, I'm pleased to welcome everyone uh, today to our webinar, uh, Non-Hormonal Female Contraceptive Strategies. So my name is John Hannibal. I'm a member of the, the, uh, the organizing committee for the, this symposium. And I'll be a moderator for today's uh, meeting, along with Francesca Duncan from the Department of Obstetrics and Gynecology at the Northwestern School of Medicine. So um, we're, we're very excited to have everyone back today uh, for the last of our three-part three part series on solving challenges in contraceptive discovery and, and innovation. And just a few logistics before we begin. So um, first of all, all participants are placed on mute throughout the call. So if you have any questions, please submit uh, your, your question using only the question and answer feature on the bottom of your screen. Do not use the chat feature. Um, they're not being monitored through, through, through that, that um, portal. Also, questions will be monitored and read by Dr. Duncan at the end of each presentation. Um, if um, we don't get to the questions, they'll be um, sent to the, uh, to the speaker so that they can address them directly. Um, and also, just as a reminder, the webinar is being recorded and will be made available to all members on the SSR website. Then uh, lastly, just a, a, a few other uh, housekeeping items. Uh, uh, in terms of the award winners for the best oral abstract presentation, that will be announced at the uh, virtual happy hour uh, after the end of today's session. So there will be three awards given for uh, the abstract that was uh, selected for oral presentation. The best poser poster presentation awards, again, there will be three and that will be announced at the end of the, the poster session. So without any uh, further delay, it's a great pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker for today's session, Dr. Diane Duffy. Uh, Diane is Professor of Physiological Sciences uh, and she's the Vice Chair of Research at Eastern Virginia Medical School. And her talk today is Ovulatory Angiogenesis as a Target for Novel Contraceptive Development. Diane? Thank you, John. Um, let me know if you can see these slides. Does that look good to you? Can't quite, can't see them yet. All right technical issues. Okay, so one more time. There we go. How's that look? Good. Okay. Uh, you're on the, uh, the uh, presentation mode, the notes mode. What does that mean? Uh, we can see your, your notes. Can and see my notes that I'm supposed to remember to thank you. <laughs> okay. Well, I'm glad, to, glad to see that. <laughs> okay, one more time. I'm actually very embarrassed because we practiced this. Okay. How's that one? That is great. Looks okay. great. Okay, ready to go. Thank you, John. Really happy to be here today, um, despite these technical challenges, and happy to lead off this excellent group of speakers to talk about female contraceptive targets. So I want to start by talking about um, what we all know about vascular changes in the ovulatory follicle. Um, there's been a great deal of work that's been done looking at how stromal vessels are remodeled um, in the period between the LH surge and actual ovulation. We know a lot about how um, this vascular basket, as it's called, 
um, is remodeled in response to an ovulatory gonadotropin stimulus. And the stromal vessels that surround the follicle, um, they become larger, they become more dense and branched, um, with the exception of the formation of an avascular area at the follicle apex. So as the rest of the follicle is experiencing this increased blood flow, there is selective vasoconstriction at the follicle apex that allows the formation of a rupture site. So these vascular casts that, um, can be done easily in smaller species. Um, larger animals, we usually rely on ultrasound. So in um, domestic animals and also in women, ultrasound studies show these same kinds of changes in the stromal vessels that surround the ovulatory follicle. However, neither of these approaches can reveal the changes in the smallest vessels that are occurring in response to the ovulatory gonadotropin surge. And it's these smaller vessels that we study in my lab. Um, looking at these um, histologic images from the macaques that we study um, just reinforces what we all know, that the granulosa cell layer of the preovulatory follicle is an avascular space. In these images, the um, vascular endothelial cells are stained red for von Willebrand factor, an endothelial cell marker. And you can see that all of the red staining cells, these endothelial cells, are located in the ovarian stroma outside that granulosa cell basement membrane. And in response to an ovulatory surge of luteinizing hormone, there's a massive angiogenic event that occurs such that seven days later in a mature corpus luteum in the primates we study, there's a, an extensive capillary network such that we think every luteinizing granulosa cell is in direct contact with an endothelial cell of this branching capillary network. So the question that we are asking is, how does the LH surge initiate this process of new capillary formation? So we just looked at ovulatory follicles from macaques throughout the periovulatory interval, starting with a preovulatory follicle um, before administration of an ovulatory dose of HCG. And in these images, the endothelial cells are stained brown. You can see that they're still all located out in the ovarian stroma and that the granulosa cell layer does not have any endothelial cells present. 24 hours later, we're seeing endothelial cells start to push from the ovarian stroma into this granulosa cell layer, such that 36 hours after HCG, which is just before the time of follicle rupture in our species, we're seeing extensive networks, um, intersecting networks of vascular endothelial cells present in the granulosa cell layer. So in order to have a model to study these events in the ovulatory follicle, we went to the literature to try to understand um, what were the most likely models of new vessel formation that might explain what's happening in the follicle. And we focused our attention on two methods of vessel formation, vasculogenesis and angiogenesis. Vasculogenesis is the primary mechanism by which new vessels form in the embryo, although there are instances of angiogenesis in adult organisms. But the concepts behind angiogenesis start with circulating angioblasts or progenitor cells that take up residence in tissues that are in need of enhanced vascular supply. And these angioblasts form a focal area of vessel formation. And then the vessels formed in this primary vascular plexus eventually grow to reach back to both the arterial and the venous circulation. And that provides new blood flow that's needed in the tissue. Angiogenesis is a very different way of forming new vessels. And angiogenesis relies on new capillary branches forming from existing vessels in a tissue. Angiogenesis occurs in response to specific stimuli. In this image, um, we're, we're using a growth factor, but other examples include hypoxia or the products of tissue damage. Whatever these um, stimuli are, they set up a gradient, and that gradient attracts an endothelial cell from a stable vessel and encourages it to become a migratory cell type, which is called a tip cell. And that migrating tip cell um, is migrating towards the source of the stimulus. And that tip cell communicates with adjacent endothelial cells, encouraging those cells to form the capillary stock or the lumen of the forming capillary, such that ultimately 
you end up with a branching network of capillaries that have their origin in that original vessel. So with these two models in mind, we wanted to see which best fit the angiogenesis that we were seeing in the ovulatory follicle. And so we turned to some 3D modeling where we took serial sections of monkey ovulatory follicles and stained for um, endothelial cells, which are again shown in brown. And then we traced all of the endothelial cells from these adjacent sections into some modeling software and built a three-dimensional model of the vessels. And so in these images, you can see that the stromal vessels are indicated with the arrows. There's also a longitudinal vessel that connects the two um, cutaway vessels. But importantly, all of the endothelial cells identified in the granulosa cell layer could trace their origins back to one of these stromal vessels. So we believe that the model that, that best explains what's happening in the ovulatory follicle is this model of branching angiogenesis. Um, to explain how these new vessels are forming. So branching angiogenesis requires a growth factor or other stimulus to initiate angiogenesis. And I think we all know that the LH surge or HCG in our experimental models initiates a large number of events which together um, constitute the ovulatory cascade but only a few cells of the follicle, the theca cells and the outermost granulosa cells, really have a large number of LH receptors. These cells respond to LH directly and they produce paracrine mediators or growth factors, which act at the rest of the cells of the follicle to regulate ovulatory events. And progesterone is probably one of the best known paracrine mediators of ovulation with multiple effects on ovulatory events. Um, EGF-like growth factors have been characterized and are, are probably best known for their effect on cumulus expansion. Um, today we're going to talk about both prostaglandins and angiogenic factors as both potential mediators of ovulation and also ovulatory angiogenesis. So starting with um, PGE2 as a paracrine mediator of ovulation, um, it's been very well established in, I believe, every mammalian species that's been studied that PGE2 is a paracrine mediator of key ovulatory events. And I'm just going to show you a summary of our data from the macaque model, but this has been documented in a large number of mammalian species, that the ovulatory surge initiates granulosa cell expression of a large number of prostaglandin synthesis enzymes, including the key um, enzyme PTGS2, also known as COX2, and induces the expression of that enzyme. And after the expression of COX2, we see follicular fluid PGE2 accumulating in the follicle. So to determine if PGE2 is essential for ovulatory events, we utilized a model of follicle injection where we inject test compounds directly into the follicular fluid of our macaque follicles. Then we come back, we administer HCG to initiate ovulation, and then we come back a few days later and recover the ovary to assess whether ovulation was successful. And in these studies, when we injected vehicle, we had successful ovulation. Um, you can see the very large rupture site, um, which was confirmed with histology. And we also confirmed that oocytes were not trapped within these follicles. When we injected the prostaglandin synthesis, synthesis inhibitor into methicin, um, follicle rupture sites were either non-existent or very small, like the one shown in this image. And we found oocytes trapped within these follicles as shown in the histologic image. And finally, when we co-injected into methicin and PGE2, we restored ovulation, both follicle rupture and oocyte release. So this is how we confirm that in macaques, PGE2 is necessary for ovulation. And it turns out PGE2 is also necessary for ovulatory angiogenesis. Um, sections of these follicle injection ovaries were stained um, for endothelial cells. And you can see that um, in the vehicle injected follicles, um, we see great luteinization of the granulosa cell layer and is indicated at the arrows, endothelial cells that reach all the way from the stromal vessels to the antral edge of the luteinizing granulosa cells. Indomethacin, um, which blocks prostaglandin production, um, compromises luteinization, but it also 
um, prevented endothelial cells from migrating into that granulosa cell layer. But when we co-administered indomethacin and PGE2, we restored both luteinization and angiogenesis in these follicles. So in order to really query how PGE2 was regulating angiogenesis, um, we wanted to be able to explore the actions of each of the four PGE2 receptors shown here. These receptors are all um, G-protein coupled receptors, and you can see their proposed G-proteins in this cartoon. Um, to study these receptors in detail, we isolated microvascular endothelial cells from monkey ovulatory follicles. And we stained these cells for um, the four known PGE2 receptors and verified that the endothelial cells from our monkey ovulatory follicles do express all four of these PGE2 receptors. We also wanted to be able to use these receptor or these endothelial cells in quantifiable assays for key events in angiogenesis. And so we developed a panel of useful assays to focus on migration, proliferation, and sprout formation. So remember, migration is the first step in um, branching angiogenesis. This is the function of the tip cell to lead the way for the new capillary. And our migration assay is very straightforward. We plate cells on a porous membrane, and the cells can migrate through these pores towards a provocative stimulus. Um, we can stain them, and they're easily quantified. Um, we use KI67 as a proliferation assay. There's lots of great proliferation assays. Um, this is just the one we chose to identify cells in active cell cycle. And remember, proliferation is one of the key functions of those stock cells um, that are growing to um, form the new capillary stock. And then finally, we have a capillary sprout formation assay where we have small polymer beads that we can coat with our endothelial cells, place them into a 3D fibrin matrix, and treat them with our growth regulators. And we can photograph these, these beads as often as we need to. And through the photographs, we can both quantify the number of sprouts that form and also um, determine their length. So two quantifiable metrics of angiogenesis. So using these assays, we found that um, these PG2 um, and its receptors do regulate angiogenic events in vitro. Um, PGE2 and agonists for each of the four receptors were able to stimulate migration in our assays, and none of them were able to stimulate proliferation. I think this sprouting assay was the most interesting, where PGE2 and just the agonists for receptor 1 and receptor 2 were able to increase the number of sprouts that formed in vitro. So these receptors were most interesting to us in terms of ovulatory angiogenesis. So we went back to our follicle injection model to further investigate the role of each of these four PGE2 receptors in both ovulation and ovulatory angiogenesis. And I've already talked about the control experiment, so I'll just focus your attention on the response to receptor one and receptor two agonists, which were both able to restore mostly restore successful ovulation. We saw rupture sites, cumulus expansion, and very rarely found oocytes trapped within these follicles. And each of these agonists was able to mostly restore normal angiogenesis in our tissues. So also considering a bunch of data I don't have time to talk about today, including some immunostaining, we demonstrated that receptor one and receptor two are expressed primarily on the migratory tip cells. Um, we did this through immunostaining and also functionally showed that receptor 1 and receptor 2 agonists are able to stimulate um, migration and also sprout formation in vitro. Um, we don't think that the stock cell functions are particularly sensitive to PGE2, and I think it's interesting that um, PTGER3 and 4 are most highly expressed in those stable stromal vessels that surround the follicle. So I think these are the receptors of stability and that PTGER1 and 2 respond to PGE2 to stimulate ovulatory events and also ovulatory angiogenesis. So of all of the regulators I'm going to talk about today, this is the pathway um, that's moved the furthest towards contraceptive development. And I'm just highlighting um, a few of the many studies that have been conducted to explore whether 
prostaglandin inhibition or receptor blockade could be a potential female contraceptive. I think the earliest work that was really directed towards contraception was done by Mads Bronström, and similar work was done by um, Cruxado and Jessam using prostaglandin synthesis inhibitors in women um, with ultrasound um, assessment of ovulation inhibition as the primary endpoint. And these studies were very successful when um, prostaglandin synthesis inhibitors were administered consistent with use as an emergency contraceptive, less, less successful when administration was more um, as a daily contraceptive would be used. Um, studies in my lab used um, the prostaglandin synthesis inhibitor meloxicam in our monkey model. And with an emergency contraceptive administration, we were able to show ovulation inhibition and also pregnancy prevention. Um, we were much less successful with the daily administration. And finally, um, Marina Palufo and Dick Stauffer's group at the Oregon Primate Center used a proprietary bear compound, which was a PTG ER2 antagonist in the monkey. Um, with daily administration showed great pregnancy prevention. So this pathway has a lot of potential for um, development of a novel contraceptive. And maybe in the Q&A or in the um, social hour afterwards, we could talk about some of the challenges that this pathway has faced in moving further towards contraceptive development. So I'm going to move on and talk about the vascular endothelial growth factor family of ligands and receptors and how they're involved in ovulatory angiogenesis. Um, the VEGF family is probably the best known angiogenesis regulators, and they have been explored both in early follicle development and also in the corpus luteum. And some of the early studies using inhibitors of the VEGF system showed that disruption of the system can um, prevent or block ovulation, but there was a very little examination of the vasculature in these studies. And when we started our studies, there was extremely little information about placental growth factor, or PGF, in the ovulatory follicle. So PGF and VEGFA were the focus of our studies because they are the primary ligands for VEGF receptor 1 and VEGF receptor 2. Placental growth factor is likely the primary ligand for VEGF receptor 1 in vivo. Um, um, VEGFA can also activate this receptor. And then VEGFA is thought to be the primary ligand for VEGF receptor 2. So first we wanted to document the expression of these growth regulators in our ovulatory follicles. And just drawing your attention to panel D to start, um, uh, administration of an ovulatory dose of HCG um, rapidly induces VEGFA mRNA expression in granulosa cells of monkey follicles, and VEGFA also accumulates in the follicular fluid of these monkey follicles. Um, looking at panel A, placental growth factor mRNA is induced by the ovulatory gonadotropin stimulus, but there is a time delay in the induction of PGF mRNA and a delay in the accumulation of PGF in follicular fluid. We did use immunostaining to confirm that placental growth factor and VEGFA were expressed in granulosa cells of our ovulatory follicles, and they do co-localize in the stroma with CYP17, suggesting that ECA cells may also express these vascular regulators. And I think the timing of the expression is very interesting. Um, the LH surge or HCG turns on VEGFA expression and accumulation very, very rapidly, but there's a lag um, for the induction of placental growth factor that I think is functionally very important. So to look at the role of each of these growth regulators in ovulation, we turn to our follicle injection model again, but this time because we have protein growth factors, we injected antibodies to neutralize the activity of one or the other of these VEGF family members. So in these studies, because we're injecting antibodies, our control is an IgG of the same class and species as our test antibodies. And so when we injected our control IgG, um, we saw 100% rupture sites. We always got good cumulus expansion because we never found oocytes trapped within these follicles. When we injected a placental growth factor antibody, rupture um, was successful, but the rupture sites were smaller. 
And we um, always saw cumulus expansion in the oocytes that were trapped, and we found trapped oocytes in half of the follicles that we examined. So ovulation was compromised, but not inhibited. With the VEGFA antibody, we saw, um, we saw a significant decrease in the number of rupture sites, and the rupture site we did find was very, very small. Um, cumulus expansion was very rare, and we always found oocytes trapped within these follicles. We wanted to use our cultured endothelial cell models to explore the role of the two VEGF receptors in angiogenic events in vitro. And so we did document that our cultured cells express both VEGF receptor 1 and VEGF receptor 2. And looking through the literature, we noted that VEGF receptor 1 is associated with um, endothelial cell proliferation and increasing in capillary length, while VEGF receptor 2 is associated with endothelial cell migration and an increase in capillary number. So there's really two different roles for these receptors in, or in angiogenesis. And we're, our hypothesis was that they would serve these same roles in ovulatory angiogenesis. And it's important to note that while VEGFA can interact with both of these receptors, placental growth factor is a selective ligand for VEGF receptor one. Um, there is a form of VEGF called VEGF-E. This is a form that is expressed primarily or exclusively in the embryo. And um, we're using it in the laboratory because it's been established to be a selective ligand for VEGF receptor 2. So we used these ligands um, in our in vitro models of um, angiogenesis and found that VEGFA and surprisingly also both placental growth factor and VEGFE were able to increase migration in vitro. Um, we found that VEGFA and placental growth factor were both able to stimulate proliferation of our endothelial cells. In our sprouting assay, we noted that VEGFA and VEGFE both increased the number of sprouts, while VEGFA and placental growth factor increased the length of sprouts. So overall, this data was more or less consistent with the concept that placental growth factor acting through VEGF receptor 1 um, stimulates pro proliferation of our endothelial cells and increases the length of capillary sprouts, while VEGFE acting through VEGF receptor 2, its primary action was to increase the number of sprouts and promote migration. And of course, VEGFA is able to act at both receptors. So how do these concepts translate back to our in vivo model? We looked at the tissues from our follicle injection animals after injection with our control IgG, the placental growth factor antibody, or the VEGFA antibody. And we developed some metrics of angiogenesis that we could use with these in vivo samples. And so what we did was we measured um, the thickness of the granulosa cell layer to account for luteinization. And then we looked at the penetration of endothelial cells through that granulosa cell layer and also calculated the ratio. And in the section from the control IgG injected follicle, you can see that the brown staining endothelial cells do in fact stretch from those stromal vessels pretty much all the way to the antral edge of the luteinizing granulosa cells. In the tissues from the placental growth factor antibody treated tissues, you can see that there is some endothelial cell um, movement into the granulosa cell layer, but luteinization has been compromised and the endothelial cells really don't get anywhere near that leading edge of the luteinizing granulosa cells. And finally, in the VEGF antibody, um, the VEGFA antibody treated tissues, um, luteinization was severely compromised and we rarely saw endothelial cells um, in that non-luteinized granulosa cell layer. So to better understand what was going on with the, placenta, the placental growth factor antibody injected follicles and to understand the role of placental growth factor in ovulatory angiogenesis, we turned back to our 3D modeling and again confirmed that in the control IgG injected follicles, the granulosa cell, um, the endothelial cells that we found in the granulosa cell layer indeed still traced back to those stromal vessels confirming our hypothesis regarding branching angiogenesis. Um, we saw a very different picture with the placental growth factor antibody injected follicles where 
we saw nice stromal vessels that are indicated by the red arrows. And the, we, saw gran, we saw endothelial cells moving into the granulosa cell layer indicated by the little blue arrowheads. But you'll notice that there's not a connection between these migrating endothelial cells back to the stromal vessels. So remember that placental growth factor is the growth factor acting via VEGF receptor 1 that's stimulating the functions of those capillary stock cells. And when we neutralize PGF, we lose the ability to make those stock cells. Um, we didn't see angiogenesis in the VEGFA neutralized follicles, so we didn't model it. But that's very consistent with the concept that VEGFA is acting through VEGF receptor 2 to initiate angiogenesis. So just as a summary, um, we think that effective blockade of this pathway has potential as a contraceptive. Um, our data are consistent with the concept that the TIP cells are expressing VEGF receptor 2 and responding primarily to VEGFA to initiate new capillary growth. Um, VEGFA is also important for follicle rupture, cumulus expansion, oocyte release, and it had a major impact on luteinization. Um, our data are consistent with the concept that the stock cells in the ovulatory follicle are expressing VEGF receptor 1 and responding to placental growth factor primarily to um, simulate proliferation and the formation of those capillary stocks. PGF had a modest impact on rupture site size, on oocyte release, and a modest impact on luteinization. So in the last couple minutes, I wanted to talk about a new family of vascular regulators we're starting to look at, the thrombospondins. Thrombospondins are a family of structurally related proteins. Um, they're complicated to study because they're secreted, but then they rapidly become associated with the matrix. So it's challenging to figure out what the concentration of active ligand is for receptors in this system. The thrombospondins are um, interesting molecules. As you can see in the cartoon, they have multiple domains of activity. And I just want to draw your attention to the N-terminus region, which has been associated with the proangiogenic actions of thrombospondins versus the type 1 repeat region, which has been associated with the anti-angiogenic actions of thrombospondin. So when we first started studying this family, we looked for all four thrombospondins in ovulatory follicles. And thrombospondin one was the family member that was, in, was induced um, by HCG. Um, the data on this slide show granulosa cell levels of the mRNA and protein increasing after an ovulatory dose of HCG in vivo. Um, the immunostaining shows thrombospondin in the granulosa cell layer of ovulatory follicles and quite possibly also in the stroma, perhaps theca cells just outside the granulosa cell basement membrane. The other forms of thrombospondin um, were somewhat expressed, um, but weren't dynamically regulated during this ovulatory interval. So to understand what thrombospondin 1 um, does in the context of ovulation, we turn to our follicle injection model again and used a neutralizing antibody um, against thrombospondin 1. And injection of a thrombospondin 1 antibody um, resulted in compromised follicle rupture and compromised oocyte release. I think that um, this was my favorite um, neutralization study because we got the greatest variety of phenotypes in terms of disrupted ovulation sites. Everything from a tiny slit um, shown in panel B all the way to um, a completely hemorrhagic unruptured um, follicle is shown in panel D. So a variety of um, phenotypes in terms of follicle rupture. When we modeled the vessels forming in the luteinizing granulosa cell layer, again, our control IgG gave us these great branching networks of capillaries throughout the granulosa cell layer. Um, the thrombospondin 1 neutralized follicles had um, endothelial cells in the granulosa cell layer, but they hadn't migrated very far. And again, we're seeing a loss of um, 
endothelial cells tracing back to those stromal vessels. So while we are apparently seeing migration, we're seeing again a lack of um, either formation or maintenance of those capillary stock cells that maintain the connection between the migrating cell and the stromal vessel. So we've just started looking at thrombospondin receptors in the follicle to try to identify um, receptors that might be good targets for ovulation inhibition and um, disrupting angiogenesis in the follicle. And we focused our attention on three receptors which um, are reported in the literature to be um, involved in angiogenesis. Um, CD36 is a receptor that interacts with the type 1 repeats of the thrombospondin molecule and it is an anti-angiogenic receptor um, that triggers apoptosis. LRP1 and SDC4 um, both interact with the N-terminus region of the thrombospondin molecule. And these are both pro-angiogenic receptors in that they stimulate migration and sprout formation. So looking for these receptors in the cells of the ovulatory follicle, we identified all three of them um, with mRNA expressed in our granulosa cells and um, our endothelial cells in culture. Um, LRP1 and SDC4 had the highest levels of mRNA in our granulosa cells and also showed the best immunostaining in these preliminary images. And we have also um, verified that these receptors are expressed in our endothelial cells in culture. So going forward, we're gonna be focused on um, LRP1 and SDC4 as possible receptors that are mediating the ovulatory response to thrombospondin 1. So in summary, I hope I've convinced you that the vasculature of the ovarian follicle is actively remodeled in the ovulatory period and that new capillaries are forming in this luteinizing follicle via the process of branching angiogenesis. We've talked about different paracrine mediators of the LH surge that regulate the vasculature of the ovulatory follicle with a focus on PGE2 and its receptors, the VEGF family, and also the thrombospondin family, which we're just starting to explore. These angiogenic factors are necessary for ovulatory angiogenesis. It seems as though PGE2 and VEGFA are most important for the formation of those migratory tip cells to um, lead um, the formation of new capillaries, while placental growth factor and thrombospondin 1 seem to be more important for the formation of stock cells and maintaining connection from those leading tip cells back to the stromal vessel and ultimately establishing blood flow. We've also shown that blocking angiogenic factor production or action in the ovulatory follicle disrupts key aspects of ovulation. We focused our attention on follicle rupture and oocyte release as key metrics of ovulation. Um, going forward, I hope that we have the opportunity to look at other aspects of ovulation. And I'm particularly interested in the concept of oocyte maturation and how it might be regulated by these angiogenic factors. Um, the image that's on the background of this slide, um, this histologic image was from our thrombospondin 1 antibody injected follicle. Um, one of our antibody injected follicles from this study. And this particular ovary, um, thrombospondin 1 was neutralized. It did go ahead and have a small rupture site. And as you can see, the oocyte and its surrounding cumulus were released. And they're cl it's clinging to the surface of the ovary, waiting to be picked up by the fimbria at the time this ovary was recovered. I just want to point out that the oocyte in this image is still germinal vesicle intact. So despite follicle rupture despite cumulus expansion, there's still a possibility that this oocyte would not be capable of fertilization, and that's something we need to explore more. I'd also like to spend more time looking at luteal formation. Anytime you compromise the vasculature, you risk compromising luteal formation, and we all know that women need to be experiencing these cyclical changes in estrogen and progesterone for their overall well-being. So that's something we need to look at in our models in the future. And these are the questions I'm asking myself going forward in this system. First of all, you know, we've demonstrated that these angiogenic factors are important for angiogenesis, and we know they're important for ovulation, but we still don't know if angiogenesis itself is necessary for ovulation. 
As we think about developing therapeutics, we need to ask ourselves if adult humans engage in angiogenesis on a regular basis or if we can disrupt angiogenesis as a potential contraceptive, and if so, how we would go about delivering an angiogenesis regulator as a contraceptive molecule. So with that, I um, just want to recognize the people in the lab that do the work with some special thanks to some colleagues who have been involved in these studies from the very beginning. Um, I want to highlight the Mellon Foundation. I was a Mellon junior investigator um, in 1999, and that's how I got started doing this work, and since have been supported by Eastern Virginia Medical School, my institution, and also the National Institutes of Health. And I'd like to acknowledge product donations from Merck, which support our work. So thanks to you for your time and attention and happy to take any questions. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Duffy, for a really awesome talk. Uh, you have many questions. Um, I'll just start with the first. Um, can you, do you have any um, information about what explains the COX-2 inhibitor um, efficacy when it's delivered as an emergency contraceptive versus as a daily contraceptive? None whatsoever, and we spent a lot of time trying to um, figure that out. Um, this was the most embarrassing contraceptive study I think that's ever been done because the more of this medication we gave or the longer we gave it, the more fertile our animals were. And I can't explain that unless there are other aspects of fertility that were being enhanced in these studies. Um, I am hoping that I'm remembering this correctly, that in the studies that were done by Croxato and Jessam, they um, also tried with women administering um, prostaglandin synthesis inhibitors for different time frames, trying to bracket really when would be the optimal time for administration. And I believe they had the same experience roughly, that the, the longer they administered it, um, the less successful it was at blocking ovulation. And no idea why that is. Okay. Um, so given contraceptive induced menstrual uh, changes are a reason users may discontinue current hormonal contraceptive methods, how do you expect targeting ovulatory angiogenesis will impact menstruation in either desirable or undesirable ways? And this question is from um, Amelia McKenzie. I think that's a great question and that's something that I think about. Um, we know that if we completely disrupt angiogenesis that the corpus luteum won't form. But we are seeing degrees of angiogenesis in all of the models that we're studying. We haven't been able to take any of these models out far enough to see if the corpus luteum forms or um, how progesterone synthesis is impacted. One thing that I've noticed in the short time frames where we have studied these animals prior to ovariectomy is we, um, we don't see progesterone, um, serum progesterone levels compromised in the first couple of days after HCG administration. So I'm not certain that we need the full luteinization that we see in um, a natural menstrual cycle to get sufficient amounts of progesterone for women to have those cyclical changes that they really need to maintain their health and the healthy reproductive tract function. Um, so you, you sort of alluded to this um, or acknowledged this in your last slides and sort of thinking forward, but how would you imagine or how are you thinking about sort of administering um, a contraceptive that would target this angiogenic um, mediators? I think, um, you know, there are a lot of ideas out there about contraceptives that would block ovulation and many of them are... Um, are gonna require some way of targeting the ovary in particular to reduce side effects. And the mechanism that I think about most often, um, you know, would involve nanoparticles and the ability of nanoparticles to recognize molecules that are, relatively speaking, unique to the ovary. Um, that would minimize um, the presence of those chemicals elsewhere in the body. Um, I really think that the, um, the cancer therapeutic field is going to move forward with targeting and help us out. Um, once they figured out for cancers, hopefully there will be therapeutic modalities that we can use to deliver contraceptives more selectively. Um, and I think we have time for one more. Okay. Um, 
And this is from Philippe Godin. Um, in your opinion, which cell type would be better target in the development of a novel contraceptive um, targeting angiogenesis? Would it be the stock cells or the tip cells? That's a great question, and I don't have an answer to that at this time. I would love to be able to take some of these studies um, longer into the luteal phase. I think that's really where it's going to matter is when which of those can we get good um, or good enough luteal development? That's, you know, back to a previous question. I think that, you know, those questions are spot on about how do we block ovulation but still preserve enough luteal function to have cyclical changes in a woman's body. So I don't know, but I, it's a great question. Perfect. Thank you so much, Dr. Duffy. I will turn it over to John to introduce the next speaker. All right. Thank you, Diane, so much. That was a great uh, start off. Um, and uh, now on to the next speaker, speaker uh, Dr. Xiao Zhao uh, from Rutgers University is going to be speaking on 3D in vitro follicle culture as an effective model for contraceptive discovery. Zhao. Thank you for the introduction, Joe. Can you see my uh, slides? Yeah, yeah it looks good. Okay. Great. Uh, thank you again, John. Good afternoon, good evening, or good morning, everybody. Like John said, depending on uh, where you are. So at first, I would like to thank the organizing committee for inviting me so uh, we have the opportunity to share our research. So Dr. Duffy has already given a great introduction about the angiogenesis in the ovulation and also the basic like 101 about the ovary and also follicle biology. I'm not going to repeat it here. So in our lab, we are studying how to use the in vitro follicle culture model to phenocopy the follicle development, oocyte set maturation, and also the ovulation process in vitro. In this way, we can use this in vitro model to effectively and also efficiently study the ovary toxicology disease and also uh, ovulation. So we have been using the alginate hydrogel encapsulation method to culture both mouse and human follicles. So alginate encapsulation can maintain the 3D architecture of the follicles. For example, if we culture mouse follicle for eight days, the follicle can develop from the multi-layer secondary stage to the pre-ovulatory stage on day eight. And upon the HCG stimulation, the antral follicle can rupture and also ovulate on metaphase two oocyte. And the follicle after ovulation will differentiate into the corpus luteum-like structure. So here, our research question is that whether we can use this in vitro model for the high throughput ovulation screening for the new contraceptive discovery. So ovulation is a pretty complex process and many molecules and also signaling transduction pathways are involved in this process. For example, the histology images on the left indicate a 14 hours ovulation process in vivo upon the HCD stimulation. And we can see the expansion of the cumulus oocyte complex in the center at eight hours and also the rupture of the pre-ovulatory follicle and also the extrusion of the oocyte at 12 hours. And the figure on the right indicate most of the well-identified signaling pathways during ovulation. It is a complicated figure, but don't be scared. In general, it can be summarized into several key events, including the bending of the LH and also the LH receptor, which can activate the downstream cyclic AMP and the PKA pathway to increase the expression of some EGF-like factors such as AREG, EREG, and also uh, BTC. And then this EGF-like factor will further bind to the EGF receptor, either in the granulosa cells or the cumulus cells to induce the expression of the COC expansion marker, such as HIS2, PTX3, and also TANFA6. And the cyclone AMP and the PKA pathway can also induce the expression of the PTGS2, and Dr. Duffy already gave a brief introduction about this gene. So PTGS2 is for the COX-2 enzyme production, and the COX-2 further responsible for the 
synthesis of the PGE2, which is also called the prostaglandin. And the prostaglandin is very important for the angiogenesis and also proteolysis during the ovulation. So furthermore, the activated cyclic MP and the PKA pathway will also induce the expression of progesterone receptor, the PR targeted genes, and also the genes related to the follicle rupture and also the luteinization. So in our follicle culture model, the antral follicle can respond to the HCG for ovulation in vitro, like the 14-hour video, like I'm going to show you right here. So this is a follicle grow from the R in vitro model. And you can see the antral uh, cavity right here. And here is a cumulus oocyte com uh, complex. So after the HCG treatment, you can see there is a significant morphological change. And we can see the COC expansion and also the rupture on the follicle apical side. So however, we don't know whether these in vitro cultured follicles can also preserve the ovulation at a molecular level. So we recently treated in vitro cultured antral follicles with HCG to trigger the in vitro ovulation. And then we collected follicle at a different time point for the single follicle RNA sequencing analysis. The principal component analysis of our RNA sequencing result indicate the follicle can be well separated by the HCG treatment time, indicating the significantly changed transcriptomy upon the HCG treatment, even though we have two outlier, but they are still very well uh, separated. So here's the control group, one hour, four hour, and eight hours post HCG treatment. So the volcano plot on the right shows the differentially expressed genes between zero and four hours after the HCG treatment. So if we see the top 10 most upregulated genes, you should be familiar with most of them. For example, Dr. Duffy introduced the PTGS2. It is for the COX2 uh, enzyme production and then for the production of the prostaglandin and uh, then regulate the ovulation. And if you, if you check other top 10 genes, you are also familiar with most of the others, such as the BTC, EREG, AREG, TANFA6, and the HES2. Actually, the second most upregulated gene is the SALT1E1. This is, gene, is a gene for encoding the estrogen sulfate transfer rates. It can add a sulfate group to the estrogen and inhibit the estrogen activity which is very important for the ovulation and also luteinization. So today, because of the time limitation, I'm not going to talk too much about this single follicle RNA sequence result, but we have another short oral talk from Ji Yang at 6 p.m. and also a poster presentation from Britt. They will give you more detailed information about a single follicle RNA sequencing analysis. So in summary so far, our results indicate the in vitro cultured follicle can both morphologically and also mechanistically phenocopy the ovulation in vivo. So for the next step, I will introduce how we further use the vitrification method to establish a long-term storage and also ready to use follicle biobank, which can allow us to perform a high content follicle culture and also ovulation screening. So vitrification is a pretty commonly used crop preservation method, particularly in the reproductive medicine. So most of the oocyte and uh, embryos are crop preserved using the vitrification for fertility preservation. So in general, the oocyte or embryo will be incubated in the equilibration solution that contain the permeable crop protectant such as a DMSO. And in this way, the osmotic pressure will change from the hypertonic to the isotonic state. Then the oocyte or embryo will be incubated in the vitrification solution that contain both permeable and also non-permeable crop protectant for dehydration. So we can then keep this vitrified oocyte or embryo in the liquid nitrogen for many years. So however, vitrification of follicles can be a different story because follicle structure is much more complicated than the compared to the individual oocyte or embryos. So in this project, 
we collaborated with Dr. Mary Zalinski from Oregon and test many different vitrification protocols. And finally, we have successfully used a closed vitrification system and also an optimized vitrification recipe to make sure we can have more than 95% of the survival rate for the follicle after vitrification. So to make sure these vitrified follicles are also functional, especially for the ovulation, we also perform the in vitro follicle culture and examine the follicle and offset reproductive outcomes for both fresh and also vitrified follicles. So our results indicate that the fresh and the vitrified follicle, they have comparable follicle development from the preantral to preovulatory stage and also the hormone secretion of the estrogen. And more importantly, they also have comparable ovulation and also oocyte meiosis. So we recently published this result where you can check more detailed information. So right now we have long-term storage and ready to use follicle bell bank. And for the next step, I will introduce how we further use a tiered screening method for the new contraception discovery. So recently we developed a tiered ovarian function screening strategy to screen compound who have potential ovary toxicity. So here we want to adapt our, this idea to perform a high throughput ovulation screening. The tiered screening include the high content compound screening at a single high dose. And for the positive compounds that can inhibit the ovulation in tier one, we will advance them to tier two for the dose response and the specific window exposure and then for the compound who have consistent ovulation inhibition in the tier two, we will advance them to the tier three for the mechanism identification and also in vivo model of validation. And for the Gates Foundation project, we will specifically screen the reframe compound, which has about 14,000 small molecular compounds, and they have been tested in clinical trial or preclinical trial. And we know their molecular target, and we also and know their toxicology or safety data. So we will perform the high throughput ovulation screening to repurpose this reframe compound to find their uh, like anti-ovulation uh, potential. So currently we have done some pilot experiment by collaborating with Dr. Jian Jun Sun from the University of Connecticut. For example, we use our in vitro model to validate their compounds that have been tested in the Drosophila model. For example, we recently tested 11 of them, and three of them show consistent follicle rupture inhibition in our mouse follicles. And the follicle in the control group, you can see they can rupture pretty well. But for the, uh, these three compounds, most of the follicle, they cannot rupture. And uh, Yuping Huang from Dr. Sun's lab, he ha she has a poster presentation where you can get more uh, information. So at last but not least, I would like to thank uh, all my collaborators, my lab members, and also the whole ovary biology co-platform. Uh, and I also want to thank the support from Dr. Jody Floss and Mary Zalinski on my KO1 vitrification project. And I also want to thank the financial support from NIH, NSF, and also the Gates Foundation. Thank you for your attention, and I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, uh, Dr. Zhao, for an excellent talk. Um, one question is uh, whether you've compared global uh, in vitro to in vivo molecular signatures. Uh, so you mean global? Yes. So we did. So actually, Jiang has a presentation, and she will do some like geo analysis and also uh, signaling pathway analysis. So for actually for most of the uh, well identified molecules and the genes, we see consistent expression, but she will also present some data uh, which can have uh, like allowed us to find some like a new pathways that may drive the ovulation based on the global comparison. Okay. Um, is there, have you looked at angiogenesis um, in the in vitro ovulation system? Yeah, that is a very good question. So after Dr. Duffy's talk, I see, oh my God, my in vitro model does not have the angiogenesis. Yeah, so uh, yeah, this is like a, one of the non-perfect parts for the in vitro model and we don't have blood supply. But uh, probably, I'm not sure whether you uh, remember our EVATA system, the micro 
the microfluidic system we recently designed. So actually that is a cool system we can figure out this issue. So we can use the microfluidic system to co-culture the like endothelial cell or other cells involved in the angiogenesis. So we can use the microfluidic chip to vascularize the follicle and then we can introduce angiogenesis and also the immune cells. So just to sort of follow up on that a little bit, so would this mean that, so have you looked actually at the angiogenesis, so do you know if there's vasculature in the system or would this indicate if there isn't that you don't need angiogenesis for that process? Uh, so for our platform, uh, we don't have angiogenesis. Uh, so Francesca, I, I want to make sure I 100% understand your question. Have you actually looked to see whether or not there's blood vessels that are maintained in the system or, or not? So oh, I see. That? Yes, that's, that's a good question. So actually after like a four or six days culture based on our histology data, uh, we don't see the blood vessels are maintained there. Yeah. And another reason is because usually we culture uh, from the secondary stage, usually there's like a limited blood vessel in the internal thicker cell layer. But we believe if we culture more advanced stage of the follicle, maybe we can like maintain the blood vessel for like two or three days and then we don't have to worry about this issue. Okay, one quick question. Um, have you looked at the time course of follicle rupture in vitro and is it similar to in vivo? Oh yeah, that is another very good question. So for today, because of the time lim limitation, I only compared the zero and the four hours. So actually we did do the time, like a timeline comparison. So progesterone receptor is a very good example. So we see like a hundred fold increase at a four hours after the HCG treatment. And then at eight and a 12 hours, they were significantly decreased. And this data is also consistent with a recent pub paper published by Dr. Jacob's group because uh, the follicle need a high expression of the PR to support the ovulation. And then they also want to drop it down to inhibit the PTGS2 and the prostaglandin uh, production to make sure there is no over inflammation in the ovary and our data is consistent to um, their result. Excellent. Thank you so much. I'm going to uh, thank you and turn it back to John. All right. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, um, so our next speaker is uh, Dr. Marina Palufo. Uh, she's from the Endocrinology Research Center in Buenos Aires and she'll be talking um, on uh, chemokines and their potential application for new female contraceptive development. Marina? I know Marina's been having internet issues, so um, I don't know if I just saw her and I'm not sure if she just dropped off. And it looks like we lost her. So I think that what we'll do is we'll, um, try to see if we can resolve this and then uh, maybe move her to the end of the 15-minute uh, talk. So we'll go next to uh, Sergio uh, Romero from the University of Peru. And um, his talk will be on oocyte uh, maturation mechanism and potential targets for contraception. So uh, Sergio. Hello, John, and thank you. Um, I want to thank also the organizers, uh, but, uh, for inviting me to, to do this presentation. Can you see my slides now? Not yet. Not yet. Just hold on a second, please. Okay. Is it okay now? Yeah. Yeah, that looks good. Okay. Thank you very much. So yeah, uh, I want to start by saying that uh, I've, been, I've been working uh, some years in, uh, in the oocyte maturation uh, project. Uh, basically, I, I was a former student uh, of uh, Professor Johann Schmitz in the University of Brussels, where we developed uh, different um, kind of systems, culture systems for uh, the ovarian follicles. Um, but I'm now relocated to Lima already for uh, a couple of years. And uh, I'm working on uh, at the university, at the Cayetano Heredia University, where we try to develop also some other uh, IVM models for, for bovine. And uh, at the same time, uh, I'm working at an IVF clinic in Lima as well, 
in which we, we are trying to move forward also with the in vitro maturation. Uh, so I dedicated uh, uh, some years already to, to in vitro maturation, IBM. And I want to start by just giving a brief introduction on the differences between the uh, in vitro fertilization and the in vitro maturation. Uh, so in the ART technologies, so meaning the assisted reproductive technologies, we have the uh, IVF, which actually aims for um, pushing the follicles and the, uh, to develop in the ovary by the administration of gonadotrophins to the patients. And then we get uh, a mature oocyte by the end of the treatment. Normally this treatment takes uh, 10 to 15 days to get there. In the case of in vitro maturation, we are trying to develop follicles in a, to a smaller, some sort, uh, I mean, sort of a smaller stage. Um, so usually uh, in the IVF, uh, we trigger the ovulation when the follicles reach like uh, 17 to 20 millimeters in size. But in the IVM in human, we, we conventionally use uh, follicles of about 10 millimeters. The main difference there is that uh, because we have given a few hormones to the patients, then we get uh, oocytes which are at the immature stage in the germinal vesicle stage. And these oocytes, they need to undergo uh, a culture in vitro for about 30 hours in our standard protocol. And, and this will allow us to have uh, M2 uh, mature oocytes. But of course, the, the main difference here is that um, while in the IVF uh, you treat the patient, in the IVM you aim to treat the gamete. And you have to develop the system in a way that it makes, makes it possible to have an oocyte which, which has a very good quality for developing embryos. So uh, why to develop IBM? Well, um, first is because we need to provide an easier and less costly uh, treatment for the patients, so the fertility patients, and also to increase the access to treatment. So in countries like uh, Peru, for instance, we don't have uh, insurance covering for the IVF treatment. So the patients, they need to pay from their pockets. And of course, uh, treatments are not cheap. So we have to make something or find something cheaper for the patients. Uh, the positive points, uh, sorry, uh, for IVA, IVM is that you require less consultation, less moni monitoring, less injections of hormones, and there would be less side effects. Um, the problem is that uh, there is a learning curve for IVM. There are some uh, few information on the children born after IVM. And also there are some prejudices. Basically, people tend to believe that it doesn't work. And why is that? It's because of the, uh, there is a truth on that, that there is some uh, uh, suboptimal results uh, after IBM. So, but this is basically related to the fact that the, the stimulation protocols for the patients are, are uh, very variable. There are different models for treating uh, IBM patients. Then the maturation rate is different also, and this is linked to the fact that the protocol that is applied to the patients um, also that the embryo yield is, uh, is low and the embryo quality seems to be low as well. Um, so in a way of saying, uh, um, yeah, there, is a, there are some uh, negative points, but the, the IBM is the only ART uh, technology that has zero risk for uh, ovarian hyperstimulation syndrome. So uh, how can it be improved? Well, there are several ways, but we, we thought that uh, some of the things that we have to consider are the gamete competences. So the, the fact that the uh, oocyte should be able to reinitiate meiosis or complete the meiosis and also to, to be able to develop into a nice embryo. Um, also, we have to study signal in cascades and some other uh, research fields. Um, so looking back into the folliculogenesis, there are several processes that they need to go right in order to get a, a good quality oocyte. And in fact, uh, when we are dealing with in vitro maturation, we are targeting very small follicles, uh, as I said before. And so the, pro the follicles are in the process of acquiring all the competences that will lead to the production of a good quality embryo. Uh, so we're in the middle of the process, for instance, to, get, uh, to, be, to become meiotic competent. And also the, these oocytes uh, will not have the capacity to develop into embryos after uh, 
fertilization. In the same period, we have uh, the process of trans transcription and silencing, and also the, the fact that the organization of the chromatin within the, the oocyte is, is not complete. They should reach uh, uh, a very compact stage of uh, chromatin organization before the oocyte, the oocyte is able to resume meiosis. Um, but this is all uh, occurring during this time frame in which we pick up the oocytes for IVM. Um, uh, we, I want to revise also some uh, other uh, processes that are happening within the oocyte. And uh, this is the process for meiotic arrest, for instance, or the mechanism for meiotic arrest. Uh, the oocyte should have uh, a good amount of cyclic AMP. Uh, that is coming from the cumulus cells and by the, uh, by the production of the, of the, of the same cyclic AMP by the oocyte. Uh, and this normally will maintain the meiotic arrest. But once the, the phosphodiesterase 3, which is present in the oocyte, uh, degrades the cyclic AMP, this will, will lead to meiotic resumption. Uh, so when the oocyte receive, or the, the, the follicle receives the signal to uh, start ovulation, then there is the production, for instance, of uh, second messengers, which are the EGF factors, epiregulin, amphipredinin, and beta cellulin, and they are all going to have a, a, an action on the cumulus cells. These cumulus cells will start uh, the process of, uh, uh, of being prepared for the ovulation, so there, there will be the production of some specific genes. Uh, so there, there will be a process of inflammation, the production of extracellular matrix, there will be also phosphorylation of the connectin 43 and the regulation of a very important uh, receptor, which is the MPR2 receptor, which is the, the one that is holding the, the meiotic arrest by production of uh, cyclic GMP that uh, aims to uh, inactivate the phosphodiesterase type 3. So, uh, it's also believed that uh, during the process of ovulation, there is also an interaction of the signaling of this CMP on the on the MPR2 receptor, and uh, by that we stop the mechanism that is causing the meiotic arrest. So, uh, by using all this knowledge, we developed a system which is the, what we call the Kappa IVM, and this Kappa IVM intends to uh, synchronize the competences of the of the oocytes, so the nuclear and developmental competence. Okay, and uh, how do we do that? We 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 provide some natural meiotic inhibitors. In fact, we are we are uh, supplementing the the culture medium with uh, inhibitors of uh, meiosis and natural inhibitor like uh, C-type maturity peptide, and also some other uh, physiological level of uh, of you know, essential compounds and. While we can maintain the rest for, 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 for a while, we ensure that there is a, a nice communication between the oocyte and the cumulus cells, and this seems to help it to, to acquire the developmental competence that it needs. So uh, with Kappa IVM in a human, we have uh, achieved to have successful maintenance of meiotic arrest during the, the, the Kappa stage and then uh, also promoting the communication between the oocytes and the cumulus cells. And this somehow leads to a, a, an increased meiotic maturation, uh, uh, increasing the number of food quality embryos on, on the tree, and then a good, uh, good amount of uh, good quality blastocysts as well. And this kappa IBM actually is ready to, uh, to culture follicles uh, or to, to culture COCs, cumulus oocyte complexes, coming from very small follicles. So we, we believe that we, we, we can culture follicles from even two millimeter size. So as this all is based on the, on the fact that, uh, that, that this system exists, so the CMP MPR2 system exists in the cumulus cells and the oocyte, uh, we wonder whether this can be a potential target for contraception. And actually, this is something we have not uh, explored much yet, but uh, I want to show you some of the things that can uh, um, that give us an idea on how this uh, contraceptive discovery can go in, uh, by using CAP IBM. So, for instance, there is there is this paper uh, from 2010 in which uh, John Epic and, and Sang Maya Sang they demonstrated that, for instance, if there is a, a mutant a mouse for MPR2, so for the receptor of CMP, or for CMP itself, uh, uh, 
there is always uh, the possibility that the, 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 those follicles in the process of uh, folliculogenesis, when they reach the antral stage, they cannot uh, hold the meiotic arrays. So they, they demonstrated that by uh, causing a mutation either in the CMP or the receptor, then we have uh, a large amount of walls that are reinitiating meiosis. So they cannot even uh, maintain the rest within the ovary. Uh, ourselves in Brussels, we have uh, performed uh, Sergio, some Sergio, just to let you know, it's uh, time to wrap up pretty soon. Yes, 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 okay. just a couple Thanks. of slides. So uh, in Brussels, we have shown that uh, the production of CMP uh, maintains uh, maintains semiotic arrest also in the in vitro culture follicles. And also if we put in vivo grown follicles next to those uh, 2D culture follicles, we, we maintain the arrest at least for a couple of hours, I mean, six hours that we tried. Uh, in case of, um, of models, for instance, there is a model for um, uh, PCO, so polycystic ovarian syndrome in, uh, in human, but in mice you can, you can try to, to develop a model that uh, copies or at least displays some of the, uh, of the, of the symptoms or the signs that uh, show uh, polycystic ovarian syndrome. Uh, but in the in the mouse, so for instance, if you if we supplement uh, androgens to the to the mice, we still we start to have problems with ovulation, and also these guys have shown that uh, CMP and NPR2 are upregulated in the in, in in those animals. So it points and it suggests that uh, even the the fact that the that the PCO patients have problems with ovulation is probably related. Uh, uh, to the fact that the elevated androgen contents may be working through the CMP NPR2 uh, system. So just to wrap up, uh, I want to show some uh, potential, uh, as, I mean, wh what I see as potential uh, ways to, to, to develop uh, contraception using this system. So for instance, uh, if we can manage to have CMP delivery, target CMP delivery to the ovaries, we, by controlling the release of continuous CMP, this should be possible, it should be possible to, to maintain the arrest in the oocyte. Another point, another way is for instance, using CMP agonists. So targeting the NPR2 receptor. And there is, for instance, studies showing that uh, CMP analog, BNN uh, 111, you can uh, use this, for instance, in a contraplasia to try to, to boost the, uh, the response of the NPR2 receptor. So this, of course, we have to find a way in which this can be targeted specifically to the, to the ovary. And another way is by taking the, the results of the model for PCO in which we, we can modulate the, the steroidal hormones in the, in, the, in the ovary. We can also try to, to boost the NPR2 system uh, CMP and PR2 system, and this will uh, maintain basically the arrest uh, of the oocyte. All of this can be tested in different models, and we believe, for instance, that Kappa IBM would be a system that can be useful for that because we have enough time uh, in the culture, 40 up to four, uh, 24 up to 48 hours in culture, in which we can uh, just maintain the meiotic arrest and, uh, and uh, replicate the very last stages of the oocyte in the, in the ovary before ovulation, and then we can also uh, mimic the ovulation in vitro. So uh, I, I think we'll skip this one. Uh, um, just to thank all the people that have collaborated in all these studies, uh, we have a very nice collaboration with a hospital in Vietnam in which we could uh, replicate uh, or do translational research from the mouse to the, to the human, and we are using by the time being Kappa IBM, and it's working very nicely. So thank you. Thank you, Sergio. I think we're going to, um, a, a question or two has popped up. I think we'll just send those um, directly and you can um, address those offline. Um, to keep on time, we'll, we'll move to our next um, speaker. And I see that uh, Dr. Palufo is back online. And um, so uh, we'll, we'll, we'll go to her talk. And as I mentioned, um, she is going to be talking about chemokines and their potential use in as um, female contraceptives. So Marina. Thank you, John. Can you hear me? Yep. Yeah, we okay, see your slides. Great. I hope my internet lasts at least for 15 minutes. <laughs> um, so first of all, thank you. Um, especially thanks for the SSR, the ISC, and the Bill and Melinda 
Gay Foundation for supporting this um, symposium. And I especially want to thank the organizer for inviting me and giving me the opportunity to share my results with you. In this 10 minute talk, I would like and I will try to show you the most relevant results. So during the end of my book talk, I became interested in the chemokines during the perulatory interval, and particularly on a monocyte chemiotractin protein one, also known as CCL2, I'm not sure that um, Marina's still with us. Hello. Yes. Okay. I'm here. Okay. All right. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Can Go you ahead. hear me or not? Yeah, we can hear you. Go ahead. Okay. I'm sorry. Well, so when I look at the mRNA levels of the receptor as well as the chemokine ligand, I observe a significant increase at 12 hours post HCG. More interestingly, when I uh, look at the protein levels in the follicular fluids of these follicles, I also observe a significant increase at 12 hours post HCG. It is important to emphasize that this time point is when I think that um, the internet connection is too spotty. Yeah. Hey, Marina? Yes. Uh, you're cutting in and out. I don't know that we'll oh. be able to um, continue. Do you want, we'll try one more time, and if you want to continue, and we'll see how it goes. Okay. I'm sorry. Um, okay. So, um, back in Argentina, I set up my lab using the domestic cat as my lab model. And we first wanted to evaluate the mRNA expression of CCR2 and its chemokine ligand and CP1, 2, 3, and 4 within the cumulocyte complex as well as the follicle wall after an L8 stimulus in culture field and intrad follicles. So to test this, we use ovaries from female, adult, and uh, domestic cats at different stages of the natural estrus cycles and we isolate the antral follicles. Then we individually culture them in the presence or absence of the late, and we culture them for different hours. At the end of the culture, we isolate the COCs and separate them from the follicle wall to further perform the RNA extraction of each compartment following by real-time PCR. And these are the results. We observed the expression of the CCR2 and its four chemokine ligands, NCP1, 2, 3, and 4, within the COC as well as in the follicle wall. But I will focus only on CCR2 and its male ligand, NCP1. In this slide, I'm showing the graph corresponding for the normalized results for CCR2, mRNA levels, as well as NCP1 within the cumulus cells and the follicle walls. And interesting, we observe a significant increase in the CCR2 mRNA levels at six hours with the LH treatment in comparison to its control. For MCP1, however, we see a similar pattern. It did not read significant due to its high variability among the samples. But what is interesting also is that at this time point is when we observe the highest levels of MCP1 within the follicle wall. So then we wanted to examine the direct effect of an exogenous stimulus of recombinant MCP1 on the mRNA expression of hyperavitory genes in the COC, as well as on osage maturation using a feline COC culture system. So to test this, we isolate first the antral follicles and then we recover the COCs to further culture them in the presence or absence of two different concentrations of recombinant NCP1. 
And then we culture them for three hours in the case of gene expression or 28 hours for in vitro maturation. But before performing the COC culture, we fix some COCs to perform immunofluorescence to detect the presence of the CCR2 especially and the localization within the COC. And we also analyze the chemokine MCP1. We, we observe the immunolocalization of both the receptor and its chemokine ligand MCP1 within a free-line COC in the cumulus cells as well as in the ozone. Here in this slide, you can see the positive staining for both protein in red. So then after confirming the presence of the receptor, we perform the COC culture and we observe that the recombinant MCP1 was able to significantly increase the mRNA level of key genes involved in the ovulatory cascade, such as HAS2, sorry, the enzyme responsible to synthesize the hyaluronic acid during the cumulus site expansion process in the cumulus cells, and pyreolin, the ECF related ligand that um, mediate or synergize the, the action of the LH, and two genes that encode for proteins that stabilize the expanded matrix. Regarding the oocyte maturation, we observed that the recombinant MCP1 was able to significantly increase the percentage of M2 state oocytes in spontaneous maturations in vitro. However, it did not um, stimulate uh, the gonadotropin-induced maturation. So then we wanted to determine whether the inhibition of CCR2 signaling in the COC interfered with the expression of key periodontary genes using our feline COC culture system. So to test this, we culture the COCs in the presence of non-inducers of humerus site expansion and also oocyte maturation, such as the gonotropins, the amphirolin, and prostaglandin E2, in the presence or absence of, um, of an extremely selective CCR2 antagonist. And these are the results. Interesting, we observed that this highly selective antagonist was able to prevent or interfere with the gonotropin stimulation of HAS2 array. TNF alpha induced protein 6, as well as pentaxin 3. In the, in the case of amphirolin stimulation of the periovulatory genes, we observed that this antagonist was able to inhibit the stimulation of HAS2, AREG, and TNF alpha induced protein 6. However, in the case of pentaxin 3, the antagonist was not able to inhibit the stimulation caused by amphiregulin. And regarding PCU2 results, they were similar to the one observed for uh, amphiregulin stimulation, where the antagonist was able to inhibit the stimulation of HAS2, amphiregulin, and TNF alpha induced protein 6. However, in the case of pentraxin 3, neither PCU2 nor the antagonist had a significant effect. So to summarize, our results demonstrated that MCP1 has a direct effect on the COC by increasing the mRNA levels of key genes involved in the ovulatory cascade, as well as by increasing the percentage of M2 oocytes in spontaneous oocyte maturation. Also, our results demonstrated that the stimulation of periovulatory genes mRNA levels by gonadotropins, amphirolin, and PCE2 occurs at least in part through the CCR2 MCP1 pathway, proposing CCR2 as a novel mediator of the ovulatory LA signaling, identifying this pathway as a possible candidate for a non hormonal contraceptive. So, finally, I would like to thank my present and past members of the lab. Martina, Julieta, Nadia, Mariana, and Eduardo, the endocrine lab from our institute and its director, Gaby Robelato, 
uh, our national collaborators, Marino Rutia, Juan Pablo Jaworski, and Gabriela Jaita. From the US, Dick Stoffer and Sean Hannibal for allowing me to use the samples and the reagents to start my project and for always being there. Uh, Dr. Kelly Young from California that we performed some studies um, of another chemokine that I didn't have time to show. The, um, also the Centro de Sanidad Animal de la Municipalidad de Merlo that kindly donated the ovaries for this study. And also the funds, especially the Fogart International Center from the NIH for my grip grant and our national agency for promotion of science and technology. And thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Paluso. Um, a question um, from Daryl Russell. Um, have you looked at um, the effect of um, the MCP inhibitor on cumulus expansion? I know you showed the data on uh, the actual gene expression of key genes, but have you looked at the effect on expansion itself? No. Um, in fact, we performed the immunofluorescence just the Saturday before the shutdown was in Argentina. So we never have time to show, uh, to look at the results. <laughs> so we performed the monofluorescence for the hyaluronic assay to see if we actually see the, the expression of the hyaluronic acid in our, um, in our group that we think that uh, we um, have the, uh, the, 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 that caused the expansion and antagonist will inhibit that. Do you have any um, ideas of the mechanism of action by which MCP may be impacting the cumulus cells? So, you know, I think we typically think about it, like you said, with the immune cell regulation. I mean, do you think this is a different target or what are your thoughts there? Can you repeat the question? I, I hear it all cut. <laughs> so, um, what you know, what is the effect, what is the mechanism of action for the MCP on um, the cumulus cells? So is it actually on the cumulus cells or are there, is there another cell type that's been affected? No, I think the, um, the MCP1 came from different sources, from the cumulus, from the oocyte, the granulosa cells, uh, um, from a lot of them. But I think that is actually, it's a, it's a key player in the cumulus suicide expansion process itself. It is not related with the, with the known function as a, chemo, uh, as a chemo attractor. I think because they have a direct effect inducing maturation and also all the gene expressions that are commonly uh, induced by the gonadotropins, the, the amphibolin, all the, all the, the the molecules that are responsible for the cumulus suicide expansion pro process, for example, I think is another player of this uh, whole picture. And do you, oh, what, one last question. Okay, um, this is from Lisa Atkinson. How extensive is the MCP CCR2 system in other tissues? Do you know? Um, yes, well, they are expressed, the CCR2, it's mainly expressed in immune cell types. But in the ovary, it's expressed in the theca, in the granulosa, in the tumulus, in the oocyte, in the stroma. Uh, MCP1, basically almost every cell can synthesize MCP1. When I am proposing the CCR2 MCP1 pathway as a possible target for, non, for a non-contraceptive uh, method, I'm not thinking about blocking MCP1 or C the CCR2 because that is very important for the immune system. You cannot block that, that's for sure. I think that we need to look at some, um, some molecule through its signaling that is probably more unique in the ovary rather in the immune cell system. Because if not, you are going to cause Maybe you don't get pregnant, but you have a lot of issues that it, they are much worse than getting pregnant. <laughs> well, thank you so much, Dr. Palufo, and I'm glad your internet connection held out. So I'll pass it over. Okay, I'm so sorry. No worries. <laughs> thank you, Marina. Way to, way to hang in there. Um, <laughs> great, great talk, thank you. 
Um, so now we're going to move on to our selected um, uh, talks were selected from from abstract submissions, and um, the 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 first speaker for this group is Joan Tao Din from the University of Adelaide. Um, um, she will be talking about the unique molecular mechanism of progesterone receptor in granulosa cells during ovulation. So Joan. Thank you, John, and thank you for the opportunity to discuss our work today. Um, hopefully, everybody can see my screen all right. Just gonna pass on. Yeah, we can see it. All right, thank you. So, as has been highlighted throughout the course of these meetings, there is a real need for the development of female, new female contraceptives. One of the reasons for this is because current progestin based contraceptives mainly work through disrupting the normal endocrine patterns which unfortunately leads to a res um, many harmful side effects in all the target organs that are also under the influence of these hormones. In order to bypass these unwanted side effects, our approach is to directly target the process of ovulation itself, which can be a more, sa um, a more safer, um, ethical, and easily reversible non-hormonal contraceptive strategy. For this, our overall aim is to understand the unique mechanisms that are required for ovulation, and this will be essential in designing drugs specifically targeting this process. One of the key factors in ovulation is the progesterone receptor, or PGR. The essential role of progesterone receptor in ovulation has been shown through a number of NEMAUS models in which the lack of progesterone receptor leads to um, block of ovulation and therefore incom uh, complete infertility in female mice. This makes progesterone receptor a promising target for ovulation mediation. But what we need to keep in mind is that not only it is important for ovulation, but it is also present in other parts of the re female reproductive tract and plays various roles leading up to fertilization and pregnancy. So it is essential that we understand the unique mechanisms that is employed by progesterone receptor in the process of ovulation. Because progesterone receptor is a transcription factor, our first step was to look at the gene expression profile that is governed by progesterone receptor in different female reproductive organs using the PGR knockout mouse model. Using this, we saw that progesterone receptor regulates very different groups of genes in a tissue-specific manner. This leads to the question of how these unique transcriptional regulation patterns can be mediated by progesterone receptor in a tissue-specific manner. To understand this, we need to look at the molecular mechanisms that is employed by progesterone receptor. As a nuclear receptor, it can target its downstream genes through two pathways, either directly binding to the PGR response element or PRE in the canonical pathway, or in genes lacking this element, it can still exert its influence through indirect binding with binding sites for other transcription factors. With this in mind, we hypothesized that progesterone receptor employs unique mechanisms in each tissue to regulate distinct target genes and thereby gaining context-specific functions. To investigate this, we perform progesterone receptor um, chip seek in two female reproductive tissues, the uterus and the ovarian granulosa cells where progesterone receptor is expressed. We quickly found out that progesterone receptor targets very distinct chromatins in these two tissue contexts with very little overlapping between the two. More importantly, in the granulosa cell context, we saw a clear um, preference for promoter binding in close proximity to the transcription start site, and this is not observed in the uterus. Using motive enrichment analysis, we also showed that progesterone receptor in different tissue contexts can target very distinct groups of non-canonical motives that correspond to other transcription factors. This suggests that progesterone receptor has specific chromatin binding properties in different reproductive tissues, and this is likely achievable through the cooperation with other transcription factors in a tissue-specific manner. With this in mind, we decided to look further at a potential partner for progesterone receptor, the RUNX1 transcription factor. It by itself canonically recognizes the RUNX motive, which we have shown to exclusively bound progesterone receptor in the context of granulosa cells. RUNX1 is expressed in the granulosa cells of antrophollicles in the mouse ovary, and the expression of RUNX1 is highly induced after the LA surge in granulosa cells. Using proximity ligation assay, we showed that there is a physical interaction between these two transcription factors in the mouse granulosa cells, and such interaction is also induced by ovulatory cues. 
to further look at the relationship between these two transcription factors who perform Bronx1 chip seek in granulosa cells. We saw very quickly that there is a lot of overlapping between Bronx1 and progesterone receptor binding um, events um, in granulosa cells, not only at their respective target genes, such as ADMPS1 for progesterone receptor and RGCC for Bronx1, but also on a global scale in which about 70% of overall progesterone receptor binding sites in granulosa cells are mutually bound by Bronx1. Many of such binding sites are also recognized to be transcriptionally active through the H3K27AC marker. Previously, we showed that there is a clear preference for promoter binding by progesterone receptor in granulosa cells. When we looked at this in the context of Bronx1 action, we saw that such promoter binding preference is reliant on the presence of Bronx1. Whereas in promoter um, progesterone receptor binding sites without Bronx1, um, such promoter to, to 3 is no longer observed. This shows that progesterone receptor interacts with Bronx1 at many neutral chromatin sites and thereby gaining, regulating downstream genes that are important for ovulation. With all of this, we can start to build up the ovary specific model for progesterone receptor action, in which in granulosa cells, the interaction between progesterone receptor and Bronx1 and likely other transcription factors allows progesterone receptor to target specific genes, leading to ovulatory specific gene expression and therefore leading to ovulation. This implies that by blocking this process, we can prevent ovulation specific gene expression and thereby um, abolishing ovulation. And this will be important for the development of ovulation specific novel contraceptives. And with this, I'd like to thank um, our, our group at the Robertson Research Institute, um, especially Professor Dara Rossso and Professor Rebecca Bocca, our current and um, previous lab members, and our collaborators at the South Australian Health and Medical Research Institute, the NIH, and our funding bodies. And thank you for your attention. Thank you so much uh, for your talk. Um, question from Dr. DeMeo. Um, have you looked at ATAC-seq to see if the differences that you observe are due to open chromatin uh, between the tissues? Um, that is a great question, and I'm so glad I have an answer for this. Um, so we, have, uh, we are beginning that process. So we are performing um, ATAC-seq on granulosa cells at different um, uh, different points during um, the periovulatory peri um, window to see where ex um, what exactly is occurring on the chromatin level. And we are also um, doing this on um, using the PGR knockout mouse model to see whether such um, chromatin um, accessibility is reliant on um, the action of a distant receptor. And it will be very interesting to look at other tissue as well to see whether this is, um, there is any tissue specificity in this process. Um, and so a follow-up to this, do you think it would be a good idea to conduct high C to determine if there's a long distance looping that brings uh, PR bound to the PREs close to RUNCS1? Oh, that is, uh, that is my dream. Um, <laughs> would love to do that. And yes, we do see um, some indications that there are specific enhancer sites throughout the genome that um, progesterone receptor can play a role in, in the uterus more um, uh, more clearly, but also some in granulosa cells as well. So it would be very interesting to look at um, higher chromatin confirmation to see whether that plays a role. Okay, and um, one question is, how do you um, propose to antagonize some of the contraceptive target, this model that you developed, um, how do you propose to antagonize PR actions um, specifically at the sites with RUNX1? Um, so our next step is to look at exactly how this interaction occurs, either um, whether it's a direct interaction between progesterone receptor and RUNX1 and which domain of these transcription factor is playing a role. And by um, getting that knowledge, it would be um, much easier and more feasible to devise targets or um, do drug screening to specifically target this interaction and whether there's any other transcription factors or transcription activators that plays a role in this complex as well. I, I think we probably should um, move on to the next one. Thank you so much. Thank you. And we'll be again be sure to send those questions out um, for, for direct answers um, for the ones that are remaining. So our next talk is um, by Emily Harris from Washington State University. 
and her talk is progesterone signaling in the oviduct epithelial cells is required for normal embryo transport and development. Emily? Hi, can you hear me okay? Yep, can hear you. See okay. your response. Great, thank you. Um, so hi everyone, um, my name is Emily and in Dr. Winotanon's lab we study the environment within the oviduct and how that environment supports pregnancy establishment. And my project looks specifically at how progesterone signaling within the oviduct epithelium uh, supports normal embryo transport and development. Oops, here we go. So the oviduct is um, the site of fertilization, early embryonic development, and transport of the embryo to the uterus. And if this transport process doesn't occur properly, the embryo can end up implanting within the oviduct and lead to ectopic pregnancy. And if this happens, it can cause the oviduct to rupture, which is the leading cause of maternal death during the first trimester. And so for my studies, um, I'm looking at this in the mouse model. So one of the reasons I'm interested in progesterone signaling specifically is that certain progesterone-only contraceptives, such as Plan B, the emergency contraceptive, has been shown to disrupt embryo transport as well and increase the incidence of ectopic pregnancy. However, the mechanism of this action is unknown. And so within the oviduct, there's this epithelial layer shown here, and it's the innermost layer of the oviduct. And this, uh, this epithelial layer is combined of two different epithelial cell types, ciliated epithelial cells and secretory epithelial cells. So these ciliated epithelial cells have cilia here that feed and contribute to fluid flow within the oviduct. And then these secretory cells shown here secrete oviductal fluid. And these oviduct epithelial cells have been shown to change in response to ovarian steroid hormones, such as estrogen and progesterone. So here is an example of that. We're looking at the epithelium here um, across the menstrual cycle. And you can see that at day five, when estrogen increases, this causes the cell height to increase as well as increases ciliation, showing that steroid hormones can affect the morphology of these epithelial cells. And these epithelial cells have also been shown to directly interact with gametes and embryos. And so we can see that here, these cilia binding to the sperm head. And previous studies have shown that if you co-culture gametes and embryos with epithelial cells, that can increase oocyte maturation, sperm motility, fertilization rate, as well as embryo development. So overall, this is showing that these epithelial cells within the oviduct are really important for the oviductal environment to support pregnancy establishment. So my studies look at how uh, progesterone signaling through the classical progesterone receptor, or PGR, are important within individual epithelial cell types. So looking here at PGR signaling within ciliated epithelial cells and then in secretory epithelial cells to support pregnancy establishment. So for my studies, I knocked out progesterone receptor conditionally from either ciliated cells, secretory cells, and then in all epithelial cells. So here I'm showing the expression validation of progesterone receptor in our conditional knockout. So here we're looking at the control mouse in each region of the oviduct. So here we're looking at the infundibulum, ampulla, and isthmus. And PGR is expressed in every cell type within the oviduct, but here we're just focusing on the epithelial layer. And you can see that in our ciliated PGR deletion, we have PGR deleted from ciliated cells only, but you can still see expression in our secretory cells. In our secretory PGR deletion, um, we used a pretty common secretory cell marker, PAX8. However, we see that um, not all of the secretory cells are deleted for progesterone receptors. So secretory cells are mainly expressed within the isthmus, and we still see some expression here. And we also see that PGR is being deleted from some ciliated cells. So the reason we think this is is because PAX8 is also a marker of undifferentiated, undifferentiated epithelial cells that give rise to both ciliated and secretory cells. So that may be causing our patchy deletion. So this is showing that PAX8 may not be the best marker for secretory cells. And we're currently developing a new um, secretory PGR knockout mouse using OVGP1 as our secretory cell marker. So then for our all epithelial PGR deletion, you can see that PGR is still being expressed in the stromal layer and muscle cells, but we don't have any expression in our epithelial cell layer. So to determine the requirement of PGR in these individual epithelial cell populations for normal fertility, we uh, conducted a six month breeding trial. So here we're looking at the number of litters. And so in purple, we have the control file type and then our ciliated PGR deletion is shown in yellow, our secretory PGR deletion in green and all epithelial PGR deletion in pink. And you can see that um, when we delete PGR from ciliated cells, we have a reduction in the number of litters and then when we delete that from secretory and all epithelial cells, we have complete infertility. 
And we see a similar trend when we quantify the number of pups per litter as well, that we have a decrease in the number of pups per litter when PGR is deleted from ciliated cells. And once again, here we have infertility when deleted from secretory and oligothelial cells. So since we see this fertility defect, we wanted to further see whether or not this was caused from an oviductal defect. So we collected embryos from the oviduct and the uterus at day 3.5. And in the mouse, this is when the embryo should either be at the morula stage or the blastocyst stage, and they should be in the uterus. We saw that when PGR was knocked out of ciliated cells, some of these embryos are reaching the blastocyst stage. In our secretory PGR deletion, we see that some of these embryos are becoming fragmented. And when PGR is knocked out of all epithelial cells, we see that the majority of these embryos here are becoming fragmented. And so we quantified this, and here we're looking at blastocyst, uh, percent morula, and then the percent of the embryos that are underdeveloped or unviable. And we see that compared to the control here, when we knock progesterone receptor out of all epithelial cells, very few of these embryos are reaching the blastocyst stage, and we also have an increase in the percent of embryos that are becoming unviable and fragmented. We next quantified how many um, embryos were retrieved from either the oviduct or the uterus, and we saw that when we knocked out progesterone receptor from all epithelial cells, this led to about 60% of the embryos being retained within the oviduct. And so this data is showing us that PGR is required in the oviduct epithelium, not only for embryo development, but also for embryo transport. And since we saw the most severe defect when PGR was knocked out of all epithelial cells, this is the mouse model that I'll be talking about for the rest of the presentation here. So we started looking back in time to see when this embryo developmental defect started. So we had already collected at 3.5, so we collected at 2.5 and 1.5 days. And we saw that even at the two cell stage, when PGR was knocked out of all epithelial cells, this led to uh, the beginning of some of these embryos becoming fragmented. So we think here is what we're having um, is a toxic oviductal environment when we delete progesterone receptor from the epithelium within the oviduct. So next, we collected these embryos at 0.5 days. So here we have our control and our all epithelial PGR deletion embryos at the one cell stage. And we cultured these in vitro to see if this would improve embryo development. And so here, looking at our all epithelial PGR deletion embryos, you can see that at 72 hours, uh, many of these embryos are actually reaching the compaction and morula stage. And if we compare that to the previous data that I just showed, where we collected these embryos from our all epithelial PGR deletion in vivo, um, where many of these are becoming fragmented, they actually seem to be doing better in culture, further suggesting that if we remove them from this toxic environment, that helps them um, develop better. So the conclusions here are that Progesterone signaling through PGR is required in ciliated and secretory epithelial cells for normal fertility. And PGR signaling in the oviduct epithelium is required for normal embryo transport and development. So in the future, we want to further determine the cause of this embryo developmental defect that we're seeing to potentially find a contraceptive target. And so with that, I would like to thank the members of my lab and my committee members, as well as our collaborators um, for a lot of the different mouse lines that we've been using and um, my funding sources. And with that, I will take any questions. Thank you. Thank you, Emily. Uh, we have a uh, question from Britt Goods. Um, when you say toxic uh, environment, do you have any hypotheses about factors that are missing in your PGR knockouts? Yeah, so um, part of it, I don't necessarily think that it's all attributed just to the fact that things are missing, but it could actually be that something bad is being secreted as well. So it could either be that there's something um, missing such as like prostaglandins or endothelins, um, but it could also be that maybe there's certain um, immune factors that are being promoted. So an inflammation response could be promoted that are actually killing these embryos. So previous studies have shown that um, progesterone signaling can block pro-inflammation within the oviduct epithelium. So then maybe if we're removing this progesterone signaling, maybe that would actually promote inflammation. So maybe that's why we're seeing um, an increase in embryo death. And um, have you looked to that end at published microarrays on progesterone uh, receptor knockout um, oviducts for candidates? Um, for it, like uh, inflammation specifically or, or immune responses or just in general? Just in general. Yeah, so um, previous studies have shown for like the, the full global knockout of progesterone receptor that if you knock it out, um, it decreases endothelin levels in um, certain like heat shock proteins. So perhaps if we're disrupting progesterone signaling, maybe 
um, there could be a decrease in those being secreted within the oviduct that are important for embryo development. Um, and last question, um, are you able to collect um, secretion from the oviducts um, to see if there's a sec secreted factor that's changing in your models? Yeah, so that's actually in um, some of our future studies is to collect the oviductal fluid and um, use mass spec to look at the protein composition within the oviductal fluid. Um, we haven't done that yet, but hopefully we can get enough fluid from the oviduct to look at the protein composition. Excellent. Thank you so much, Emily. Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Um, and now for our last, the last talk of the last session, um, we have uh, Zhang Zhang from Northwestern University, and she'll be talking um, on mouse ovarian follicles from encapsulated in vitro follicle growth, um, preserve ovulation molecular signatures in vivo. Zhang? Thanks, Dr. Hannibal, for the introduction. Uh, let me try to share my screen. Sorry. Okay. Can you see my screen well? Yeah, looks good. Okay, cool. Thank you. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. It's my pleasure to present my work here. Today, my topic topic would be mouse ovarian follicles from encapsulated in vitro follicle growth, or EIVFG, preserve ovulation molecular signatures in vivo. Ovulation is a major biological target for contraceptive development. A deeper understanding of ovulation mechanisms and a robust in vitro model will accelerate the discovery of safer and non-hormonal contraceptives. In the earlier talk, Given by Dr. Shuo Xiao, he has already introduced the encapsulated in vitro follicle growth can recapitulate key ovarian functions in vivo, including fo follicle development, hormone secretion, offset maturation, ovulation, and luteinization. In this study, we aim to investigate whether mouse ovarian follicles grown from the IVFG system preserve molecular signatures of in vivo ovulation. By applying this model, we want to identify the transcriptomic changes during ovulation and to see how it preserves ovulatory pathways. Here is the experiment design. Multilayer secondary follicles were isolated from 16-day-old CD1 mice, encapsulated in alginate hydrogel, and grow in vitro for eight days. Entro follicles were then treated with HCG to trigger in vitro ovulation. Follicles were collected at different time points for single follicle RNA sequencing analysis. After getting the RNA sequencing data, we performed principal component analysis, and it revealed that follicles separate into distinct clusters defined by time post-HCG treatment. We can see the control group is separated from HCG treatment groups, and one hour is distinct from uh, four hour and eight hour, while four hour and eight hour are more similar to each other, indicating dynamic transcriptomic change of follicular cells during ovulation in our in vitro model then how much it can preserve the in vivo ovulatory pathway. Here you can see we summarize this ovulation signal pathway map from literature review. I know it looks a little complicated. I won't go over every detail in this figure, but briefly after HCG binds to the LH receptor, different gene networks are activated, including PKA, ERK1, 2, and EGFR networks, which further regulate downstream transcription factors and other genes. These networks are regulated by both autocrine and paracrine signals. Steroid hormone receptors, for example, progesterone receptor is mediating a number of downstream target genes. Many of them are critical for follicle rupture. Other important events in ovulation process, including oocyte meiosis resumption, cell expansion, and further luteinization. We did gene ontology and pathway enrichment analysis based on our RNA-seq data. Here I pick four hours since a lot of genes show the most dramatical change at this time point. A lot of geoterms were enriched like steroid biosynthesides and uh, ECM binding. For pathway enrichment, we can see these well-known ovulatory pathways like the gonadotropin releasing hormone receptor, EGF and the RAS pathway. Also, although there's no blood vessel in our in vitro uh, follicle model, we still see the angiogenesis pathway enriched here, suggesting at least certain related factors are still preserved. In addition, some new or not well-studied pathways like CCKR 
uh, PDGS and integrated signaling pathway are also enriched here. This may also provide us with inspirations to discover new ovulatory mechanisms. We also look at the gene expression patterns for some well-identified ovulation-related genes to see whether they are consistent with reported in vivo data. For the gonadotropin receptor, we have LH, uh, LHCGR and FSHR, both having the decreasing expression pattern. For the steroid hormone receptor, PGR, its expression level gets to the peak at four hours. Similarly, the EGF signaling ligand, AREG, EREG, and BTC also get to the peak at four hours. This expression also hold, still holds true for the COC expansion related genes, including PTGS2, HAS2, and the 10 fab 6 For the protease genes involved in follicle rupture, they show an increasing expression pattern over time. For PGR downstream genes like ranks 1, PRKG2 and the CR, CR2, CR4, their expression start to increase at four hour, which is corresponding to the fact that PGR itself gets to the peak at four hour time point. We also check the luteinization and steroid genesis related genes. For CYP17A1 and CYP19A1, as we expected, they show a decreasing expression pattern. For STAR, it shows an increasing expression uh, pattern overall. As a summary, we have confirmed that in our model, the expression pattern of most of the typical genes involved in the ovulatory pathway are consistent with published in vivo data. We validated our RNA sequencing results for some well-studied markers. For example, from our RNA sequencing data, PTGS2 showed the highest fold change among all 6,900 uh, 6, differential expressed genes at four hours. By performing RNA scope, on in vitro follicle samples, we can see this very strong expression at four hour time point, which is consistent with our RNA seq data. We also did ELISA for PGE2, which is synthesized by PTGS2. We can see the PGE2 production start to increase dramatically at four hour. Now we are doing more RNA scope validation for other genes. In addition, we also use mod, uh, modulator targeting key ovulatory molecular uh, molecules to do the validation. Here we co-treat follicles with HCG and PGR modulators or MMP inhibitors. We can see both of them can inhibit follicle rupture and the blocked ovulation, suggesting that the PGR and the protease involved uh, in ovulatory pathways are highly conserved in follicles grown from EIVFG. Taken together, our results demonstrate that mouse ovarian follicles from EIVFG phenocopy key ovulation molecular signatures that occur in vivo. Moreover, for the future directions or applications, we want to discover new ovulatory mechanisms and to apply those in novel contraceptive development with our established in vitro follicle model. Uh, with that, I would like to thank you for your uh, patient and time. I would like to thank my advisor, Teresa, Francesca, and Shaw for their support. And thanks to all my team members and our collaborators. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Jiang, for your talk. Um, a couple questions. Um, so the GNRH receptor is not expressed in the mouse ovary. Do you have an explanation for why you're picking up this pathway um, in the enrichment of your data set? Uh, so the LHCGR is expressed in the uh, granulosa cell and the FSHR is expressed in the Zika cell. So I'm not sure like, like which gonadotropin receptor uh, like you mean is not expressed? Yeah, so the, for the GNR8, GNRH receptor um, is not expressed in the mouse ovary, but I think you showed it on your um, pathway enrichment. Um, so that's something potentially to look into why that's there. Um, another question is why not compare, from Dr. Carmen Williams, why not do a global comparison of ovulation in your system uh, relative to in vivo ovulation? So right now we are doing some validation uh, on the in vivo samples. So we are still collecting the in vivo samples and we want to uh, compare the uh, our in vitro RNA seq data to some like already published in vivo data. But 
uh, there are, right now there are only some like microarray data available to be compared and sometimes it's kind of hard to compare directly with uh, microarray and RA6 data. Yeah, but definitely we want to compare our in vitro data to a in vivo model. Excellent. Thank you, Jiang, for your talk. And I will turn it off or turn it back to John to conclude this session. All right. Well, first of all, I'd like to thank um, all of the speakers. They were outstanding talks. And um, um, uh, thanks for um, going through the Zoom platform that we're all too familiar with these days. Um, also, I just want to um, thank all of the attendees. Um, again, a great, great turnout. Um, and um, just to remind everyone that there is a virtual happy hour coming up. Remember to grab the beverage of your choice. Um, and then also there's a poll that, that, that should be popping up, should be appearing. Um, please answer that poll so that we can make um, these virtual meetings as efficient and um, yeah, as, as um, um, uh, so that they better serve everyone in, in the society. Um, so again, uh, please make sure that, that you vote. And um, with that, I will um, end this session and um, hope to hope everybody can attend the, uh, the happy hour. So until we can meet in, in, in person. Hey Anna, are you, are you there? Can Are you able to speak to me? I am here. Hi, how are we going with um, assembling scores? Um, if, uh, if the other guys log off, we can probably have a conversation about that. Sure, one, two, I'm just counting to see how many. We, one, two, three, four. So it looks like there's, they still need to score the ones from tonight. I'm not seeing those scores just yet. Right, I guess those guys are probably um, hastily getting those plugged in right now. Yeah, but the other ones from the other two days are there. So I'm just going to give it a few more minutes um, and keep refreshing and see and hopefully yeah. we get these scores here in a second. Sure. Well, and if, if that fails, we'll just have them email something forward to you. And uh, would you be able to then yeah. piece it together? Yes, if they send me their scores. Yep, um, cool. And it's, it'll, it won't take long to compile because I have all the yeah. scores here. It's just a matter of getting the other ones. Cool. So then for the virtual happy hour, um, how exactly does it work? Um, when everybody logs on, will, will everybody be in one room and then they get divided out? Is yes. that right? Yes. So yep. in, that, in that preliminary part when everybody's together, I guess once we have the results, I will announce those and then send everybody off to their groups. Yes, and then we we have a presentation of PowerPoint and we'll display the names of everybody, you know, once you um, call them out. Okay, cool, So Great. everyone can see that. And then Saima will do, Saima's gonna, um, I believe, start the happy hour. Cool, yeah. Um, and then she's gonna do the breakout rooms and um, we'll, do the, we'll do the announcements then before the breakout rooms. Okay, so really, there's nothing much you need from me. No, I'm just waiting on these um, on these scores. Yep. I keep anxiously refreshing everything. Yeah. Oh, well, we've got, we've got a, a few minutes, although not too many, as the clock continues to tick. Yes. So if I don't hear anything from them by in the next five minutes, I could just email them yep. and have them send me the scores. Um. Actually, so Raj has just. Raj Kumar has just sent something to me and I guess you as well for today's scores. Oh, okay. Oh, he sent it to administrator. Yes, that's me. Oh, you are administrator? Okay. That's me. I'm never sure who's who. Yeah, I know. There's so many SSR emails, but I am administrator. Okay. So let me see. So, oh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. One, two, three, four, five, six. 
happen. Here, it looks like the scores are coming in. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven. They're slowly updating in the system, so I think we should be okay. One, two, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Looks like I'm missing just one score from each judge, but again, it's probably just the system being really slow. Yep, sure. Um, but they're coming in. Let's do one more time here. Sorry if you hear the kids' TV behind me. <laughs> no, that's fine. One more time here. Everything is so slow today. Asgi just sent me a bunch of scores as well. Oh, um, he scored as well? Yeah, well, he he had already done scoring, um, but he hadn't. One, two, three, four, five, six. Okay, he's given seven scores. Okay, they're still not like fully sinking. Let me log off and try this one more time. Hold on, I have to start the happy hour. Oh, if I start the happy hour, I'm going to disconnect from this Zoom. Yeah, I think so we I, probably should disconnect. Yeah, I need to start the happy hour. But I'm going to keep um, doing these scores, and I could chat with you on the Zoom call. Well, on, on this Zoom? No, on the next, on the, yeah. on the happy hour one. I could chat sure. with you. Sure, I'll go, I'll go log on to that one. Okay, thanks. Bye.